Hey everyone, welcome to the OFAB live stream. Today's guest is going to be um, uh, John Alexander, and um, he will be one of the keynote speakers during the Ozark uh, Mountain UFO Conference. And it's going to take place in Eureka Springs in April from the 8th till 10th. And um, so uh, for some of you later on, when we start doing the Q&A, uh, you can submit your question in the chat. Uh, simply put three asterisks before your question so it easily pops out at me. And uh, for those that would like to ask a question directly, um, you can join the um, live stream or the live chat that's going on right now in Telegram. You can download the app on your computer or the phone and see the uh, live chat going on right now. Simply raise your hand and uh, you'll be added to my queue. So I guess, uh, as always, uh, let let me then bring in the guests, and I'll let them get into their background information. So welcome, John. How are you? Uh, thanks for being on. Pretty good. Let's have a answer. Well, thank you very much for uh, for being on today, and um, I apologize for any uh, technical difficulties. We were trying to figure some things out with uh, the um, uh, slides and whatnot, and unfortunately couldn't get that figured out, but I'm glad he's connected, audio is good, video is good, so we'll go from there. So John, if you could uh, please start out a little bit about your background and what got you going in, in this in this subject in the beginning, and then we'll go from there. Well, I guess my first question would be is, which is this subject? Uh, well, about... Like a, for a whole broad range of things, and it's a UFO conference, but you know, so my talk is far broader than uh, UFOs. Well, I figured, let's start out, um, how is it that, because um, you, are you, you're a, re a retired colonel in the U.S. Army, correct? I was, uh, right. yeah, another lifetime. And so, so maybe just how, how does a colonel get involved with, let's say, ETs or consciousness uh, that, for this matter? Um, um, I don't know, maybe we ought to just publish a bio or something. I uh, had been involved in security, national security, and international security for more than half a century, been involved with, you know, various phenomena for far longer than that. Um, and, uh, yeah, but uh, while on active duty, uh, did actually run a uh, program looking at uh, UFOs. Um, I mentioned I did my doctorate. Uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was one of the head of my committee. And um, that was at a time when near-death experiences were just coming into the fore. And um, so I then became the president of the uh, International Association for Near-Death Studies. Um, in the military, we had done a lot of very strange things related to psi phenomena and, uh, of course, remote viewing. So I was on the board of directors uh, when IRVA, the Remote Viewing Association, was formed. <clears throat> also have been with the Society for Scientific Exploration for, you know, 40 years or so, served on the council there. So have been all over the world. I've dealt with shamans uh, from uh, Himalayas to the Andes to the Amazon to Mongolia. And yeah, we've, we've hit over over 100 countries and been involved with phenomena in very many of them, all eight continents, etc. Okay, and so um, but generally, when it comes to the government or the military, they always very much look at the subject in this nuts and bolt um, uh, way. Uh, what what is it that uh, got you to start uh, thinking and looking into more on the consciousness aspect of your folks? Well, you're making some strange connections there. Um, yeah, uh, I can't even follow the question, frankly. So my interest has been personal, and as I said, even predates military. I was 
uh, while on active duty, was uh, lucky enough to get into some areas. Where, as I said, we were looking at people will be familiar with Stargate and what was colloquially known as that or in other programs. We had done with psychokinesis, metal bending, and uh, just a whole host of programs that uh, I ran there. <clears throat> I said, personal interests and spanned quite a few decades. So um, is there uh, anything that maybe you could go a little bit into uh, the parts of what you were going to cover at the, at the um, Ozark conference? Well, uh, unfortunately, the slides that we made up that I'll be using there, we can't uh, demonstrate. But my point has been that one of the problems is that we tend to isolate uh, various phenomena. And I know they're talking about UFOs, but the, the slide would show you near-death experience, post-mortem communication, fire walking, psychokinesis, and metal bending in particular. Um, uh, you know, so the post post-mortem communication, spontaneous healing, uh, Interspecies communications, particularly work with dolphins and whales, have dived with whales and uh, dolphins in the uh, open ocean. Uh, uh, interesting aspects there, and even cryptozoology. And uh, as I said, I, well, I give again one of the slides, but the presentations I've talked at many UFO conferences have also been at the International uh, Amazonian. Shamans Conference uh, a number of times, talking to shamans. I said I was a founding board member on Urbis. So I've done a lot with remote viewing. Uh, and as president of IONS, I've been involved with lots of near-death studies. And the problem is that uh, for many people, they don't realize that these things are totally uh, interconnected. Because unfortunately, the research areas tend to be very stovepipe. Uh, into kind of narrow parameters, and it, it is my view that's a mistake. I think that uh, UFO happened to come down against the ETH, or what you call the extraterrestrial hypothesis, uh, not because there's not interactions, there are, but that uh, ETH, little gray guys from Zeta Reticuli, up in the end, are just too simple uh, an answer. And does not explain what uh, people are are seeing. Uh, again, there have been interactions between humans and sentient non-humans throughout the entirety of human history and in all cultures. Uh, that's not as I said not necessarily ETH, uh, but uh, again, various kinds of interactions uh, that take place. Very interested by the way and. Uh, I happen to come down in favor of reincarnation as a uh, most likely uh, probability of the way things happen before, after, and whatnot regarding uh, death. And uh, so, when it comes to then the subject of reincarnation, can you maybe explain a little bit what you found? How would these ETs then come into play? Uh, no, they'll have to study Buddhism or Hinduism for, for that. It's, it's far too broad. Uh, it means that people come back and, you know, die, go to Bordeaux or wherever, and then uh, reincarnate at some uh, future time. And you've probably had many lives, and necessar not necessarily all on Earth. Okay, and then so, for example, then from your perspective, uh, is is there eventual contact ever going to happen, or is this something that we as human beings first have to uh, consciously evolve to a level in order to understand it better? What? Regarding contact, as I said, there have been contact between humans and sentient non-humans throughout the entirety of human history. All cultures, all, you know, all has been there. 
Okay. Well, um, John, would you um, would you like to maybe go into some of uh, questions? Sure. I thought you were going to ask some. Go ahead. Right. Um, so for anyone uh, else watching, we're going to open it up for some Q&A. If you would like to ask John a question directly, um, please just uh, join the Telegram group and you'll be able to do that there uh, in chat. Make sure you have your three asterisks before uh, your question, so that way it will pop up at me easier. So, uh, John, while I give everyone else uh, some time to prepare the questions, um, basically where... Do you so these different stories about these different beings coming from these different places? Is that still a, a valid story from your point of view? Meaning, are there physical again, beings I that do, are actually I coming? Do not support the ETH uh, again, it's just too simple, and there are many possibilities that people talk about interdimensional, ultra dimensional. Um, now, if one of the questions is, is there life in the universe, intelligent life someplace? The answer is yes, uh, but that doesn't take, that's pure math based on the number of plants. You can be a materialist and, and come up with that uh, solution uh, because um, you know, the numbers are literally astronomical of life supporting planets that must exist someplace in the universe. So the probability that intelligent life has evolved to our level or beyond is almost a, a certainty. Um, but um, yeah, the, and, and the problem is what, what are you potentially dealing with? Is it where, and that's usually one of the questions that come up is where would they come from? And uh, like I say, it's terribly, terribly complex. Uh, I was going to use the last line of my book on UFOs, uh, which says that basically um, uh, whatever it is, it is more complex than we can imagine. And there's not going to be any simple answers as to what they are. I also, digressing, I usually start with, uh, just in the UFO arena, so do, what do you mean by a UFO? And the point there is we got little balls of light, got hard craft miles across, and thousands and thousands of variations in between. And so what You know, we've been dealing with now that have interactions with orbs, uh, if you will, um, that constitute UFOs or whatnot. It certainly seems to constitute uh, contact of some kind. So, um, as I say, the complexity is just mind boggling. And so, uh, because of this complexity, how um, what what can people then expect? So, for example, from just your average person that might be just interested in UFOs, is there any uh, particular fields that you want them to go into or maybe some things to read up on for them to, to understand this better? Are there uh, any something that they can kind of start out with to then eventually evolve into a better understanding? Understanding of what? Of of whatever this is, these UFOs, whatever they are, because for someone that just thinks that these are nuts and bolts, how can they better prepare themselves to understand it better? Well, some of them are nuts and bolts. There's no doubt about the, I mean, the first line of my UFO book is UFOs are real. And by that, I do mean hard, you know, some of them at least are hard physical craft. Uh, I did do a book called UFOs, Misconception conspiracies and realities been out about a decade now my more recent book that does the more comprehensive studies is uh, reality denied uh, and uh, first-hand experiences with things that can't happen but did and that goes through the various things that we have encountered and travels around the world and you know, have been going on a constant basis and scientific evidence that uh, supports 
the various phenomena. And so it's, um, and there's literally thousands and thousands of books on, on the range of the phenomena. Uh, watch some of the things here, and there, there's also a lot of wing nuts uh, that uh, get involved. Um, and um, you know, I have a. We used to have a thing when I was stationed in Hawaii that says, "If you believe," and uh, there's a lot of people that believe some very strange things that are, you know, demonstrably false. I might mention that the second to last paragraph in uh, Reality Denied is called The Flame. And in that I talk about, and I've seen friends who you get involved in the study of a wide range of phenomena um, and end up getting burned. I mean, I've just watched too many people just traipse along and get deeply involved and go off the, the deep end and things that are, you know, demonstrably false, and it uh, doesn't seem to matter. Uh, unfortunately, we're currently living in a world like that in the political arena, but uh, that's a whole other story, I guess. So, John, I have a question from Labels. Um, she's asking, do you see anything special happening for humanity, given the information that some of us are coming to understand regarding multidimensional universes and or reincarnation? Anything special coming? I don't know. We, uh, I lived through the whole inference of the dawning of the age of Aquarius and whatnot. Uh, I think we seem to be constantly uh, evolving, uh, or at least some people are. Uh, I'm not very sanguine about where humanity is headed at the moment. I think we're working at, uh, you know, do, do we survive on this planet or, or not, or make it uh, uninhabitable? Uh, we seem to be anti-nature uh, at the moment. Um, as the old saying goes, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. And uh, it, uh, yeah, I think there's going to be some levels of uh, retribution for our mishandling uh, of the environment that uh, we've been given. So uh, hopefully uh, I am a bit hopeful that uh, we have some old souls that are incarnating now who may you know, grab a hold and, and pull us up, but uh, the Earth needs a lot of help right now. Do you think that this process, this, especially in this political arena, do you possibly see this as some kind of growing pains for us? No, I think it's a death knell. I think democracy is done, but that's uh, probably not a political arena you, you want to go into. But uh, yeah, I mean, we, we were given a great gift, and I think we, we uh, as a nation, have blown it and proven we're not capable of self governance. Um, what, um, so do you, th do you think there's, um, ever going to be so for example just recently the government has been kind of changing their tune about how they view the ufos or as they call it the aerial phenomena and uh, uh, there's a bill going through the senate right now to basically create a office of um, uh, unidentified aerial well, phenomena past tense, or already been done oh That's did the past bill tense. Oh, okay. And so um, what kind of, what do you think uh, the government is really doing that for? Is it truly to just collect data and have a central point where data can be sent to? Or do you think it's for some other reasons? No, the, um, uh, I guess one of the key chapters that I have in the UFO book is on how the government works. Uh, and again, some of my slides, it says, the Pentagon says, and my point is the Pentagon says nothing. The Pentagon is a big stone building. It's occupied by about 29,000 people that come in with a wide variety of uh, opinions on things. Some of them are positive, some are 
very negative, and most of them just don't care. Now, the, the point on this is that they have had interactions that we now know have taken place um, between aircraft, but these are the ones that have come out uh, most recently. People know about the New York Times article in December of 17 that talked about the uh, ATIP program, and there was OSAP uh, before that, the big low here had, uh, had run. Uh, now, what I did was 30 years prior, and uh, they came to about the same conclusions that we did uh, 30 years ago. Again, the reality of the experiences and truly exist. I will actually make a case. This is not a government issue. Uh, they, they're getting forced into it a bit. I do think there's aspects that they should be involved in, particularly since you have interactions between uh, various weapon systems and uh, uh, you know UFOs of various kinds. But uh, I think the far uh, the the questions are far broader than any government. Uh, now. If you expand, as you said, in the consciousness areas, we have no expectation that the government would be involved in the studies that support your religious uh, beliefs and things like reincarnation, life after death, and all that. So if all of these are, are interrelated, then how can you say this is a, a proper place for the government uh, to be involved? I think they've got applications in, in a small aspect. Now, they do bring something to the table that cannot be replicated, and that's the uh, our national systems, uh, as well as tactical uh, sensor systems that do pick up UFOs and that. Uh, there's an article that just came out uh, yesterday uh, where um, uh, Chris Mellon had basically taken on the Air Force because the Air Force has been very reluctant to be involved in any of these studies. Most of the cases that are known have come from uh, naval sources and he is, has admonished the, the uh, Air Force for not being more uh, forthcoming. Uh, <clears throat> now, I happen to think that um, remember there was a Project Blue Book that went for many years uh, that was culminated with something called the Condon Report or the Colorado Report. And uh, frankly, the Condon was right in his report. This came out in 1969. And, uh, you know, the question to Condon was not, are UFOs real? It was, are they a threat? Haven't been really invaded that we know of. Well, we can argue about the presence of ET here and that, but, uh, you know, what the Air Force wanted was just make this go away because uh, and the question even today becomes what percentage of resources are you going to apply to a project that you have a very low probability of getting uh, any solution to. Uh, but currently there's enough political pressure on to at least allow them to do something. But uh, again, people don't understand the budget. They don't understand the government or how it works. Uh, I was uh, an inspector general at one point at the Department of Army level. And my boss was uh, Lieutenant General uh, Dick Treffer. And he had to create a course uh, for incoming inspectors general on how the government works and understand these were all guys who were lieutenant colonels and colonels who had 14 to 20 years uh, in the government. And most of us did not understand how it works. So you can imagine when you extrapolate that to, uh, you know, civilian society as their understanding of how our government works is absolutely minuscule. So we have kind of a slight overview of what they think things uh, work like, then they don't. They're, they're much more complex than that. 
But the bottom line on all of these is they are stewards of uh, public funds. And there's got to be certain accountability as to how they apply. So the question then becomes for people out there now, understand people watch you know, your program and all of the ones like it have a very intense interest in UFOs where they wouldn't be uh, involved. Uh, what we do know is that 70% of the population believes that there are UFOs, but most of them, it's a, a ho-hum. This is as interesting as out there, all watch the programs, but don't have an intense uh, interest. So the question from a government perspective then becomes, what percent of your resources am I going to apply to an issue that I'm probably not going to be able to get an answer to? Certainly interesting, though. I mean, I'm not denigrating interest or anomalies of the reality of the phenomena. I've been talking here from a purely, you know, business perspective, uh, and the, the amount of funding that is involved in these areas or ever has been is minuscule. Um, I give you an example. One example I used to use is the Large Hadron uh, Collider. And uh, that is something that uh, we're looking for the God particle, you know, Higgs boson or something of that nature, if you will. And we spent uh, what ten billion dollars bringing it up, and a billion dollars a year to keep it going. Uh, you know, when if you know the program that uh, that uh, Lou Alessandro talked about, they were talking about twenty million dollars which in Pentagon terms is kind of lunch money, uh, or pocket change. Uh, if, if you look at, and I do compare these to, say, rare diseases and things like that, I, I argue that the whole phenomenon that we're talking about is series are at least as complex as cancer. And we've spent hundreds of billions uh, on that. So if I translate that to, I'm going to put a couple million dollars into it from, you know, the DOD perspective, uh, your probability of success is exceedingly low. So then taking, taking that into account, would it then just be a matter of uh, just average people just then going to conferences more often, uh, building events themselves more often, and just building it bigger and bigger in order for the government to then start realizing, okay, maybe there is more interest there. What would you suggest? Oh, no, they um, they know that there's uh, interest. When FOIA first came to, into existence, that's the Freedom of Information Act, uh, uh, um, that was designed for people to be able to ask the government of questions on anything. And I believe early on, about 50% of the FOIA requests were on UFO phenomena. Of course, they didn't have very much uh, information. That's a little. Uh, so they know there's some interest, but the question has got to be uh, compared to what? Uh, as I just said, compared to cancer? Uh, compared to DOD national security int uh, interest, uh, you can make a case that interactions between UFOs and government aircraft are of interest. This is a direct threat. Um, it is the Department of Defense, not the Department of Interesting Ideas. So. Uh, you know, how do you allocate your resources? It's, uh, and again, as a manager, how much uh, in the way of resources are you willing to allocate against a program that you have low probability of, uh, you know, getting any kind of successful answers? Um, John, I have a question here from uh, Fab22. He's uh, watching live from France right now. He's um, asking, are non-human crop circles actively researched by official government scientists? And have any connections been established with NDA and non-human intelligence in regards to orbs? Thank you. Uh, not to the best of my knowledge. 
Now, and it, here's one of the problems that you have. I mean, we keep talking about the government as if it were a monolithic entity. It is not. It is made up uh, U.S. government alone, let alone foreign governments of uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of people deciding on the, the government. They have a wide range of experience. See, one of my questions that has come up is I looked in, I think there's been about somewhere around 6,000 flag officers, meaning general officers and admirals since the, the end of uh, Project Blue Book. So my question is not why do programs like the one I created, the one that Lou worked with or, or others pop up, it's why aren't there more? Because that tells me that a large number of people have had these personal experiences. So in answer, direct answer to the question, there, there is a considerable difference between individual interest and institutional responsibility. And uh, with the exception of the one program now, you do not find where uh, institutions are in general are taking this on. DNI just got the task, um, and you know they will do something. But I think at best collect a little data, but it's not going to be significant funding that would be required to do serious research uh, in these areas. And certainly, now there are people within the government who believe that they've had contact. Just like, you know, again, in the civilian sector, but again, that does not translate to, ergo, their institution or organization is having, you know, specific interest. If we're into selling body parts and, and all of the nonsense that you see, the answer is I don't really know. And I have, I, I do know about the black world or the, the, uh, I can't say black world, it'd be different. The mythical, you know, stuff that goes on on the internet. Uh, I mean, if you want crazy, I can tell you, you can find on the internet things that I personally led nuclear strike against E.T. and uh, Dulce and just absolute craziness like this. So th there's no lower level to crazy. And, uh, but you, you will find these stories out there. I put zero credibility in them. Well, when you have, especially, I mean, the, the internet is a beautiful thing, but when it comes to that, it can definitely muddy the waters for a lot of facts and information. Well, uh, a guy I would recommend here is, do you know Ray Hernandez? That Say that again. What about Ray? Do you know him for his stuff? Oh, yes, I've interviewed him several times, and he's going to yeah. be on in yeah. March well, here as well. Yeah, I mentioned that. Yeah, no, I've been down to his house and seeing the stuff that's going on. And there's a good one you say, what do you mean by a UFO? Because besides the ones over the house, he actually had ones uh, show up in the, in the living room there, and the whole dog being rejuvenated and, and all of that. But the, the study that they did, I think, is really important because it had thousands of interviewees. And what you see is a progression in thinking about the incidents that sometimes they start out as terrifying and whatnot, and people issue them and say, you oh, know, bad things are happening, I don't want to think about it, to, you know, over time saying, you know, Maybe that was really positive. And he points out in his book, he's got another one that's uh, about to come out, um, where the studies show that o over time there was a dramatic shift in perception between indi individuals who believe that they have had interactions, uh, often starting out as highly negative to, you know, looking at them in retrospect and saying, oh, that's, you know, Maybe this uh, is a positive thing. Well, I, I recommend, I forget the name of the book. It you know, suckers about three inches thick. I did do a chapter for him in the first book. So. Yeah, that, 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 is, that is pretty it. thick. 
Yeah, I was uh, watching his presentation a few years back when he was um, uh, going over the data that they found, and uh, uh, it is quite heavy. I do not want it dropped on my foot. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But uh, what's most important there is, uh, I think the finding is that the, A, he and I are very coincidental in thinking about uh, how consciousness is a key component uh, to all of these things. And, you know, that he was able to interview these people and over time see how they their shift took place in uh, their perception uh, of what those encounters were like. Uh, and like me, I think he's pretty much uh, in agreement particularly when we start talking about interactions between various kinds of sentient uh, en entities that uh, it, it can't be, it, this does not exclude the possibility of the, some of them might be extraterrestrial, but again, that just does not explain the plethora and variety and types of interactions that uh, have been reported for millennia. So um, I don't want to ch change the subject, just uh, uh, in, in anticipation of this next question I want to ask. Are there, I guess because of the internet and the information or misinformation that's been spread around, are there good guys and bad guys in government as people see it? Uh, what is your perspective on that? <laughs> of course. Okay. <laughs> Uh, how could that not be true? It's, you know, you've got millions of people in the government, and some of them are going to be very nice people, and others are going to be not so very nice. Okay, so well, the the next question, and uh, this was this question is from Nathan. It's a bit off topic. I'll leave it up to you if, if you would like to answer it or not. Um, he's asked, saying the world is in disarray. So we hear day after day and country after country is rolling back COVID band-aids. In your opinion, do you think the good guys are winning? Are the good guys? Well, first of all, we'd have to define good guys. <laughs> I'm not really sure uh, how to do that. Uh, I think the U.S. is woefully behind other developed countries. And it does get into politics, unfortunately. Uh, the uh, yeah, the people have chosen to, you know, for political interests, not get vaccinated, which allows, you know, the COVID to mutate. That's just been one of the problems. I do think that uh, you know, we're going through Omicron uh, at the moment. I've had done uh, Delta. In fact, a couple of versions of Omicron. I do suspect that there will be another one that comes along, probably more virulent. And that's because the viruses naturally emerge. And uh, like people, they actually learn in a little bit different way. In other words, through an evolutionary process, they find out what uh, what kind of barriers we put in, i.e. the vaccines and developing antibodies, and can mutate in ways that can allow that to uh, you know come up with something that can negate the vaccines, as uh, we've seen with the uh, Omicron, where you know biggest advantage to being shot and boosted as I am that. Um, you know, that you're, not that you won't get uh, some form of the disease, but it'd be much milder. So your probability, uh, just saying today, uh, the probability of dying if you've been thoroughly uh, shot uh, and boosted is, uh, you know, it's 20 to 1 in favor of the people who have done this. But again, and, uh, the issue here is not just the U.S. We have our own problems, but it's a global issue uh, because the virus does not stop at any uh, given border. Um, and, and so that as we develop these measures, and it develops countermeasures, counter-countermeasures, uh, this has got to be something that we deliver uh, throughout the entire world, 
the answer is, are you going to live with it? Yeah, it's it's some form is, is definitely here to stay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that we're winning on, on that. Again, I'm not quite sure who the good guys are. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the next question is from Pearl asking, is consciousness fundamental to the universe? And if not, uh, what is underneath it? No, well, that's the... And that, that goes back to Max Planck. Yeah, uh, consciousness is fundamental in, our, in, in my view. Uh, this is not new, uh, but I think that is the uh, fundamental building block that, that material things arise from consciousness as opposed to the other way around. And that's why I think that what we see in studying consciousness across all of these phenomena are critical. The only way you can begin to understand it is to understand the components of consciousness and as they as we see them manifest in this wide, wide range of things. But it, it is fundamental to everything. Again, a personal opinion, but certainly not unique. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Fab is asking, uh, with respect to your experience and with great appreciation to your service, what what would be your number one advice to the new generation on how to approach what you have studied, researched? Oh, yeah, I do periodically get questions from people uh, that uh, ask, you know, where can I get a job? One of the problems has been... um, you know, I have an initial slide to say if you're going to be involved in phenomena, you need three things. One is thick skin because you're going to be a task. One of them is understand conspiracy theories because you're going to be part of it. But the other one that is germane here is, you know, have a day job or be independently wealthy. Hopefully, and I think we are seeing a significant increase in interest and recognition of the importance of you know, the consciousness and consciousness interaction and all of these things. It will become broader. Uh, but unfortunately in the West, the dominant view stereo still is materialistic. You know, that, as I said, with the Higgs boson, looking for the God particle, you know, get down to things that are smaller and smaller. Um, um, I like to use uh, my experience in Brazil as a uh, kind of a balance. And the reason I, I, I've been in Brazil quite a bit, deal with some very, very, very high levels. And my point there is that many of their institutions, their educational institutions, are Western-oriented and based on materialistic uh, things. And at the same time, many periods, if you get into spiritism, you haven't gone into ayahuasca or spiritist and, and all of that, but they have, many of them have formed a way to integrate things between spiritual nature and materialism in ways that you generally don't see uh, uh, here in other Western countries. And to the specific question that was asked about where the younger, I, I think they're going to become more adaptive uh, and uh, integrate those studies in ways that uh, hopefully it will change our educational system to be more accepting. And say, yes, you are a, a, a spiritual being having a, a human experience. Uh, John, the the next question is from um, Middle Child asking, do you believe uh, plant medicines can break down the boundaries between our current consciousness and the real universal consciousness? Well, I think it's part of the same thing. Uh, I met uh, uh, Dennis McKenna. uh, Actually, in the Amazon, and I've done quite a work... uh, my wife is a, a devotee of ayahuasca. And um, it's interesting because, you know, when you go in, it makes absolutely no sense. You, you know, it's fairly complex. But the question is, why, why do the good take 
these disparate kinds of plants, put them together and make something that created uh, ayahuasca. And the classic answer is the plants told them. And as Dennis had told us, we were down in Iquitos in, uh, in the Amazon in Peru. And, uh, you know, what if plants have a universal consciousness and that probably is part of the answer to consciousness? What they used to tell us, uh, we would ask about healing various uh, diseases. And they say, you should ask the plants because they know how to do it, how to provide uh, certain things. Now, of course, biopiracy became a huge issue. And that was anthropologists and pharmacologists going in and finding out uh, what the shamans had been using for, you know, potentially centuries. And from that, trying to find out what's the, the specific pharmacological active agents in there and then, develop, and then make a ton of money, you know, through uh, big pharma. And unfortunately, the people who really understood it get screwed uh, in the process. Uh, but uh, having said that, uh, yeah, I think they can do it. The short answer to the uh, person's question is, yeah, I think there is plant consciousness and that it's, it interacts on a broader scale. And if you're open to it, uh, it can be uh, quite helpful. I will tell you also, though, I, I had mentioned ayahuasca and DMT. I am certain that psychopharmacology does not explain the kinds of uh, experiences that you see. Uh, using uh, ayahuasca, it's far more than just uh, uh, DMT or reaction to that. Great. Thank you, John. Um, middle child, just following up, just simply saying thank you for your service and dedication to this phenomena, John. Um, the other, just a statement from Foreshore saying, hi, John, I love your book, uh, Reality Denied. No, thank you. And uh, really so, so I just uh, uh, just to uh, address the audience real quick, we're doing Q and A with uh, John Alexander. So if you have any questions, please submit them in the chat using three asterisks before your question. Um, otherwise, you can join the voice chat going on right now on Telegram, and you can ask a question of John directly. So uh, John will be on just for a little longer. Uh, so please take advantage of that, uh, John. So. Basically, then, uh, so I've talked to Ray several times, and I've had him on the show, and he was um, just simply, he was explaining the complexity of, of the phenomena, you know, and uh, it's, it's very interesting, well, I should say, it's interesting what he found, but what, for example, like when I know some people that are close friends and some, you know, just uh, acquaintances, um, their mindset, for example, is not on the, you know, all about these things that mine is, for example. And so, I, you know, it's like there's part of me that wants to say, hey, you know, there's this whole subject that maybe it might be interesting to you to cover. But there's part of me said, just leave them be, you know, they're doing their thing. If they come across information, they come across it. But, you know, so I don't know. It's always kind of like this stuck in no man's land. What are your thoughts on that? You know, should we speak to people more about this or just leave them to come across, you know, your force and consciousness um, to come across it themselves? When the teacher, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Um, experience has been, you can't force this. Mm -hmm. uh, conversely, uh, used to travel uh, quite a bit and, you know, you might be on an airplane and it's amazing to me how many times you can bring up things like uh, near-death experience or UFOs or whatnot and have people say, oh, yes. You know, that was me. That, that, let me tell you a story. Um, so one of the problems that we have in all of these areas, uh, there's a vast amount of information that's out there that is not correlated. And people feel reluctant uh, to uh, come forward uh, with it. 
Uh, I'm reading a book at the moment on shared death experiences as people who've been, you know, where an individual dies and some have had near death experiences and shared death is where there's people who are with them who have part of the experience, but of course uh, come back. And one of the universal things, uh, themes that has come up is how many people who have had things like that are very reluctant to uh, address that with anybody else. And it's uh, predominantly a fear of being, you know, called you're, you're crazy or, uh, you know, excluded because of, of that from a uh, community. Um, this is one of the things that I will hope will change. And I, I, one of the things I do in uh, uh, Reality Denied, in fact, is to talk to people and say, you know, tell others about the experiences and you're going to find out it's a lot more common than most people believe. Great, thank you for that. Um, John Foreshores is, is um, asking, I have a question, what's going on right now in ufolo ufology? What are you expecting for the next five years? It seems to me it's been a bit slow for a while, at least in terms of new solid cases and footage. Uh, I would not agree with the notion of new solid cases. I think they are coming forward. And one of the reasons is the ubiquitous nature of sensor systems and not only military sensors and things of that nature and national system. We got cameras every place and they do pick stuff up uh, from time to time. Now, whether it will be a dramatic case uh, or not, I, I don't know. Uh, frankly, the UFO community has been its own worst enemy. Uh, and uh, I've, I've dealt with the skeptics. I have problems there. But I, I've often said uh, my advice to the skeptics is do nothing uh, because you know, the people involved in these areas will usually self emulate. Um, and it's, uh, I mentioned before, this is what I call the flame, getting too close to the flame. And people who get caught up in things and go off in, into things that are, you know, demonstrably false, or as you've seen some of them, almost you know, have literally created religions uh, out of this. And uh, not you know, the UFO community has, has certainly uh, had that uh, occur, as well as uh, other areas. Uh, so I think there's a need to be very practical in it. Um, uh, again, I am hopeful that some of the younger spirits coming in will, you know, take an advance and, and approach it from a much more open-minded perspective than uh, what my generation certainly has. So, John, in uh, we're coming close uh, close to to the end, so I wanted to basically leave it to you to um, just leave us with uh, with your final thoughts. <laughs> final thoughts. Um, yeah, you are a spiritual being having a human experience, and these phenomena exist, and hopefully, you know, we will continue to study them more, but understand that. As one of your questions earlier, that consciousness is fundamental and permeates everything. Uh, and um, and somebody, I think, addressed, you know, the, the approach is just to try to be the best person you can. Great. Well, John, thank you very much again for being on and doing this interview. I appreciate it. Uh, also, everyone else watching, I appreciate you logging in. So, um, um, John, uh, I, I will be uh, most likely will be seeing you at the conference because I have to do the AV there as well. So I'll definitely see you in person in okay. April. And so uh, well, but, I, I hope they run. I, I did notice there's a flyer or a flag on it now. This is we hope to run in person and I do too.
Right. Yeah, no, there's some, there has been some good news that um, uh, there's everything is still on schedule. And uh, March 1st, I believe, would be the go, no go time. And so we'll know by then for sure. But there's been some very hopeful information that uh, um, it will be in person and still going. Yeah, I, I had not heard the March 5th date. So that's good to know. But uh, yeah, I'm very hopeful. A lot of friends, because I know Ray is going to be there, and mm -hmm. you're going to have Dave Marler on. He's a good friend and has great cases, understanding um, his in-depth study in various areas, not only in uh, triangular UFOs, but he's got some great stuff that uh, he's done. And looking forward to getting back with them again. All right. Yeah, good deal. You know, definitely uh, looking forward to that, too, because I know them also well, very well over the years. So it will be nice to see them in person. So, John, uh, just uh, sit tight. We're going to just log off with the audience real quick. So, John, thank you very much. Um, everyone else watching, I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, for those that um, are interested in attending the conference, uh, the link in the description it's in the description below where you can purchase it. Also, um, uh, the link to John's website uh, is also in the description below, and I certainly hope you take the time to go and check it out. Um, I will be uh, doing a, uh, I guess, a giveaway of if you if comment in the in the comment section and like this video and leave the hashtag ozark 2022 uh come march 9th i will be picking a random video uh and then uh doing a, a random um algorithm selection that basically then would pick a winner where you can win, win two tickets for april 8th till 10th to attend the conference so Hashtag Ozark 2022, and I hope you certainly take advantage of that. So again, everyone, John, thank you. Everyone else watching, uh, take care, and until next time.